from Instagram at Timothy George asks, can you go over the most important but not so common blood tests that we should be adding to our yearly physicals, like the ones you mentioned in the energy paradox? Or perhaps are there others as well? Amazing book, by the way, life-changing. I'm lucky to have a general doctor who is very open to your teachings and will order labs that you say. Thank you. Okay, so that's a great question, Timothy George. Um, I've gotten, I, I put a whole list out in the energy paradox, but the, for those of you who have not gotten it yet. So there's certain tests that you really should get from your doctor or your healthcare provider that are cheap and easy to obtain, and then we can go into more esoteric ones. First of all, your doctor is almost certainly going to get a fasting blood sugar, a fasting glucose. Quite frankly, that isn't half as important as a fasting insulin level. Now I can tell you uh, training third year family practice residents like I do in my clinics, that most of them haven't even heard of a fasting insulin level. So if your doctor looks at you funny, just say, you know, humor me, um, please order it. Fasting insulin level. It'll cost you about $8, quite frankly. That's number one. If that fasting insulin level is above 10, then you're in trouble. You have insulin resistance. It's useful to get a hemoglobin A1C. You see, I got my A1C down on half the commercials on TV. Hemoglobin A1C looks at how you're handling sugars and proteins for the two months prior to the test looking backwards in time. But what's surprising is a hemoglobin A1C should be 5.6 or less. The closer you get to 5.0, the better. But you wouldn't believe the number of people I see with a normal hemoglobin A1C who have elevated insulin levels. The other test that some doctors can order is a HOMA IR, capital H, capital O, capital M, capital A, dash, capital I, capital R. The IR stands for insulin resistance. A HOMA IR is another really good way to see whether or not you have metabolic flexibility, which of course is one of the major subjects of the energy paradox. And about 80% of us in this country have no metabolic flexibility. Our mitochondria don't have the ability to switch on a dime to burning sugar for fuel, to burning free fatty acids for fuel. And the longer all of us study, the various chronic diseases, including dementia, including diabetes, including heart disease, the more and more we're realizing that this is a mitochondrial dysfunction problem. So all of these will actually help you point to mitochondria dysfunction. Now there's some good general purpose inflammation markers. The easiest one to get is HS-CRP. The HS stands for either highly sensitive or heart specific. Either one is just fine, it's the same test. It'll give you a generalized marker of inflammation in your body. Another useful one is fibrinogen. If you're a woman, ferritin is actually a useful marker for inflammation. Now most doctors associate ferritin with iron levels but I can tell you it correlates very poorly with iron levels. So if you're a woman and you have an elevated ferritin level, that means we need to look further into inflammation markers. Uh, so those are some simple markers to get. Uh, we can get more esoteric. One thing that I urge everybody to get is to have their APOE4 genotype measured. You've heard me talk about this, you've heard Dr. Dale Bredesen, you've heard Dr. Perlmiter talk about this. The APOE4 gene determines whether you're going to make a lipoprotein uh, that 
carries fats around your body. The ApoE4 genotype, which about 30% of people carry, is sometimes called the Alzheimer's gene. Now you really want to know whether you carry that. Because if you, whether you follow me, whether you follow Dr. Perlmutter, or whether you follow Dr. Bredesen, this is not sealing your fate that, oh my gosh, I carry the Alzheimer's gene, I don't want to know I have that, I'd rather not know. You can actively do something to prevent the development of Alzheimer's if you carry this gene. And it's well worth your money to find out about that. The other one I would get in terms of a genetic test is the MTHFR mutation. And if you say that out loud, we would bleep you from network television. We laughingly call it the mother effer gene for obvious reasons. It determines whether or not you carry a mutation that you can't convert vitamin B12 and folic acid into their active forms, which are methyl B12 and methylfolate. And knowing that actually gives you power to get methyl B12 and methylfolate into you as supplements. So if you have, for instance, anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia, alcoholism, drug abuse, and suicide tendencies, you may in fact carry one or more of these MTHFR mutations. And it's really a good idea to figure out if you have that. Now for the real nerds in the audience, uh, ask to get an insulin-like growth factor level, IGF-1. It's one of the best ways of looking at how slow or fast you're aging. And there's some fun tricks to play with influencing IGF-1. Just a word of warning. If your IGF-1 is high, above about 200 to a 250, and you're over the age of 40 or 50, that increases your risk of developing cancer. On the other hand, if your IGF is very low, it's very unusual to develop cancer. Insulin-like growth factor is simply that. It is a growth factor that stimulates cancer cells to grow. So that's a good start, and thanks for ask, asking that question. David Favella from Instagram asks, do I need amino acids? If I am a vegetarian, where can I get them from? Any specific foods or supplements? Is it true that if I don't eat meat, I need to supplement because they are only found in meat? Well, here's the good news. Um, gorillas and horses uh, don't ask about where they can get their amino acids, and as far as I can tell, uh, gorillas and horses do very well uh, with muscle mass. So amino acids are present in plants and in animals. They are the building blocks of protein. There are essential amino acids that we do not manufacture ourselves and so we have to obtain them from our diet. Now so much emphasis in the vegetarian and vegan community is combining foods so that you don't miss out on certain essential amino acids. And so much, I think, wasted time is devoted to, okay, grains are devoid of a couple of essential amino acids and beans are devoid of other essential amino acids, but if you combine grains and beans, you'll cover the base for essential amino acids. Believe me, there are plenty of essential amino acids in a vegan or vegetarian plant paradox program. You will get it from the leaves that you eat. Uh, you will get it from the roots that you eat. You will get it from the nuts that you eat. There are, for instance, several nuts like Sacha Inchi and Baruka nuts, Baru nuts, that have all the essential amino acids covered. And so you don't have to go looking anywhere else. One thing that is very interesting about vegans is vegans actually have low levels of creatine, which is a protein. 
And there are interesting studies that vegans are deficient in creatine. And there are some interesting studies that vegans have smaller brains than non-vegans because they're lacking creatine. So if you're a vegan, I do recommend supplementing with a creatine supplement. And they're not animal derived, you can get vegan creatine and just supplement with creatine as part of your diet. Uh, great question though. From Lucas Wazak on Instagram. What's the ideal age to begin fasting? Well, so fasting covers a lot of territory as I talk about in all my books, particularly the energy paradox. So, as I've talked about before, if you're a woman of childbearing age and you want to get pregnant or you're planning to get pregnant, then quite frankly, time-restricted eating, water fasting, juice fasting is not for you. I've seen so many patients that uh, fasting or intermittent fasting has actually prevented them from getting pregnant. And when we had them stop that practice, that started things. Also, if you or a family member have a tendency to focus on controlling your eating habits, then this is not for you. Um, this absolutely is not the direction you want to go in your relationship to food. On the other hand, if you look at hunter-gatherer societies, I got news for you. They're not waking their kids up at 8 o'clock in the morning for a bowl of oatmeal to send them off to hunt you know, berries. The kids don't eat until the adults eat, and many of them do not eat until 10, 11, or 12 noon with their first meal. And in fact, the idea of eating breakfast, as I've talked about before, is a modern nuance that was actually fostered in great part by the Kellogg's Corn Flakes Company in 1906, telling you and convincing you with a massive advertising campaign that breakfast is the most important meal. And it simply is not. So if you want to make this a part of normal family activities of skipping breakfast, as an example, or eating an early dinner and not snacking at night, that's a normal healthy practice. And the more you introduce your kids to this style of eating early on, you're going to set them up for a much healthier lifespan to, to come. Uh, Holly Boyko from Instagram asks, what is the best fiber you would suggest to eat weekly, daily? Thank you, Holly from Ohio. Well, so there's so many great sources of fiber, it's hard to, hard to start. Uh, certainly the fiber in vegetables, in leaves, in radicchio, in Belgian endive, in curly endive, uh, I posted on Instagram recently a salad that I had from a chef uh, outside of Missoula, Montana for the wellness weekend that was just every last wonderful chicory family of vegetables that was absolutely delicious. And I've mentioned before, whenever we're visiting s southern France and Italy, there are chicory vegetables in, in every salad, on every plate, with every meal. So. We're beginning to see radicchio, which some people call this Italian red lettuce. It's this bright red and white firm ball. It's in many, many, many grocery stores now. Belgian endive is everywhere now. It's in Trader Joe's. Grab yourself a head of those, pick up some Belgian endives, and just mix them in your salads. It's an easy way. On the other hand, ground flax seeds is a great source of fiber. It's a great source of a short chain omega-3 fat called alpha-linolenic acid. But if you're going to buy ground flaxseed, the minute you open the package, put it in the refrigerator because it goes rancid. Preferably buy whole flax seeds, grind them in a coffee grinder, and then sprinkle them on your salads. Put them in your coconut yogurt. Put them in your goat or sheep yogurt. Great way to introduce fiber. 
psyllium husk. You can get psyllium, ground psyllium husk anywhere. And don't forget that resistant starches, for instance, like a purple sweet potato that you cook, then cool and re reheat, is another great source of fiber. And not to forget jicama. Get yourself some jicama. Many places now have it pre-sliced. Use it as a dipping chip for guacamole. And guacamole has a lot of fiber. Avocados are a great source. Plenty of places to get your fiber. And remember, you're eating the fiber to feed your gut buddies. And the more you feed them, the better your health. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. Okay, so let's address a question that everybody wants to know. If it's not cholesterol, what is the best indicator for de determining your heart health? Well, that is a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it because it is my mission in life to answer that question to as many audiences